Panel one, the state of the art, current emerging technologies of the robotics, automatic and, uh, and autonomous unmanned systems and looking at the current and the future prospects. Our moderator for uh, panel one is uh, Dr. Stephanie Carvin. Uh, she's a visiting fellow at the Center for International Policy Studies at the University of uh, Ottawa, where she places emphasis on her research on law, security, terrorism and technology. I'm not sure if we should uh, introduce ourselves by saying which hockey team we support now. Um, I, I, I'm a Maple Leafs fan, so I obviously do not have a flag. I, have, uh, I do have a paper bag, however, uh, which I occasionally wear on, mostly when I'm walking around Ottawa. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is a huge honor for me to be here, in particular, uh, chairing uh, the first panel, uh, which is going to be excellent if you could uh, look in the uh, brochure that came with the conference. Um, I won't go through it all, but you can see we have uh, three excellent speakers to talk about uh, the, the issue of, of technology and, and kind of helping, I think, set the stage of, of where a lot of uh, the technologies that we'll be talking about for the next two days are actually going and what do we actually mean by unmanned systems. Last night it was noted by Major General Lanthier that war, which uh, has forever been a social activity, is increasingly moving towards what may be described in kind of a fancy academic way as what we call post-human state. Although I would say uh, this morning uh, General McMaster kind of uh, maybe kiboshed that a little bit, uh, making the case for the role of importance of, of keeping humans in warfare, but at the same time acknowledging the fact that a lot of these technologies are kind of uh, challenging the notion or, or questioning the notion of what exactly is humanity and warfare and how can we in fact maintain it. And I think to a certain extent this speaks to a paradox that we have when we're thinking about uh, our unmanned technologies, which is that we so love and cherish human life and the life of our soldiers and men and women in the armed forces that we may be tempted to actually replace them and take them out of the equation entirely in order to try and protect them. Then, of course, this poses the next question, have we actually thought through the consequences of doing so? I think it's important to state from the outset uh, to the best of my knowledge, no government has publicly stated that it is developing a fully autonomous, uh, or sorry, not developing, but in fact building a fully autonomous weapons system. However, uh, the scholar Michael C. Horowitz notes that 30 countries have developed defensive systems with uh, human supervised autonomous nodes that help protect ships, planes, uh, civilian forces from kind of some of these swarming technologies, uh, for example, swarms of missiles, swarms of planes, etc. So we clearly do have a move in that kind of fully autonomous direction, although we do have many unsolved questions. Uh, number one, what do we actually mean by unmanned? Uh, Stephanie, uh, other, uh, you might as well refer to me as other Stephanie uh, for the purpose of this conference, but um, Stephanie this morning uh, indicated, you know, there is actually no definition of what it actually unmanned means. Um, can we in fact identify which factors are pushing us into the direction of NMAND? Is it the need for speed? Is it the need for efficiency? Is it the need for uh, better amounts of control and better amounts of information? Um, is it really, you know, when we think of unmanned systems, we kind of automatically go to the stereotype of the Terminator scenario, but do we actually, you know, I think it's important to walk back from that and think, what other areas are unmanned technologies good for in warfare other than perhaps a lethal role? Just can and what will this technology help us to achieve? And of course, um, where do we think uh, all of this might be heading up? So I don't think we could have a better panel here to talk about this today. Um, so with me, I have, and actually I'm just gonna make sure I have the names correct with me, uh, we have, um, Peter Starlitz from the Intelligence Robots Lab at Lockheed Martin, Dr. Simon Moncton of the Defense Research Development Canada, and uh, I, I'm told it's J.C. Lede um, at, from DARPA. And I think we'll just go in order. If I can ask uh, the gentleman to perhaps uh, speak for 15, 20 minutes, that should still leave us with a good amount of time for questions. So without further ado, um, do you want to stand up or do you want to sit down? Great, 
thank you very much. Do we have, there we go, okay. So uh, very quickly, I am going to try to uh, talk about five different systems this morning, um, and so I'm going to go very quickly. Um, but first I would like to talk to you uh, very briefly about Lockheed Martin. Um, we, uh, we are divided into five uh, business areas, and all of the business areas have uh, some robotic or autonomous system development uh, in mind. And their purpose is to take those systems and to actually deliver them uh, to the field and to the theater. Um, under, uh, uh, overarching all of these is the corporate engineering and technology operations, uh, of which I belong. Um, my, my lab uh, is interested in the development of the technology after next. Um, and so what we do is we create uh, technologies that, uh, that are really uh, out ahead, but not ready for the field and then we flow them to these business areas and then eventually they go out into the field. So the first system I'd like to talk to you about this morning is uh, the KMAX. And, uh, and so the KMAX is, a, uh, is actually a, a logging helicopter that has been converted into an autonomous system. Um, the, uh, the mission, it, it has spent time in Afghanistan um, and the mission was to uh, transport materials from a main operating base in an Afghan valley uh, to four operating bases in, uh, <clears throat> in the mountains. And so it, the infrastructure in Afghanistan is very, uh, very sparse. And so a convoy uh, to, uh, to do these trips would take approximately 10 to 17 hours, whereas the helicopter can do it autonomously in about one hour. Um, the, um, the system is, uh, is capable of um, auto, auto landing and taking off um, the uh, uh, waypoint navigation and uh, precision delivery of materials. And this is all done using relatively simple uh, capability, or simple sen sensor set. The sensors uh, include uh, an IMU, um, a uh, radar altimeter, and a GPS unit. <coughs> using that, the uh, Lockheed Merton personnel at the main operating base were able to uh, designate where the, the system was supposed to fly, and we could uh, change the uh, changed the route every time we, uh, we flew the route. So it was always an unpredictable route. And uh, fly the helicopter to uh, the forward operating base, at which time it would be handed off to, uh, to a Marine that had been trained how to use the system. And the Marine would uh, okay the landing site and the, the system would land autonomously. <clears throat> the, uh, the impact of the KMAX uh, was pretty incredible. The uh, two systems over the course of two and a half years uh, flew four, uh, four and a half million pounds of uh, cargo and, and equipment um, to those uh, forward operating bases. Uh, it's the equivalent of 457 ton cargo trucks. The, uh, the really impressive part of it though is that no Marines had to, uh, to move with that helicopter and so there were zero hours of uh, exposure time to, to enemy contact. Uh, one other thing to note about the KMAX is that uh, we did have uh, we did do some critical deliveries. Uh, at one point, uh, the, one of the forward operating bases was getting critically low on, uh, on mortar rounds and uh, would have been out within an, uh, a day. And so uh, using an armed escort of Cobras, uh, the system autonomously delivered the equipment or the, uh, the rounds needed to, uh, to maintain the position. Um, looking a little bit more advanced, uh, the, the ACUS system is an extension to the KMAX. Um, it was not deployed, but uh, it was implemented. And basically what uh, ACUS allowed the system to do was uh, instead of going to a pre-specified FOB, we could actually go to any location that a Marine uh, called for support. And so the Marine had a, uh, an interface that allowed them to, to say, I need materials here and what those materials would be. And the system would very aggressively uh, go and land at that location. Now, it wasn't relying on the Marine to say, this is a good location for you, you to land. It would autonomously determine uh, en route uh, if or where, with relation to that Marine, was a good place to land. Uh, looking at slope, uh, topography of the, the, uh, the land in the surrounding region, and actually density of the, of the ground to make sure that it wasn't going to uh, sink or, or um, uh, <coughs> Uh, twist as it as it landed, um, very very uh, powerful and and capable system, but relied on significantly more powerful sensing capability in the way of electric op optical sensors, video cameras, as well as lidar. The next system I'd like to talk to you about is the Indigo. Um, Indigo is a small UAS, um, a very small. It can fit in a backpack. Uh, the whole system can fit in a backpack. Can be deployed in about one minute, 
and has a, actually a very uh, impressive uh, uh, minimum uh, 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 <clears throat> endurance, excuse me, of at least 45 minutes, 50 minutes, something on that order. The, the Indigo, uh, unlike most small UAS, um, actually has a fair amount of autonomy on board. Um, usually because small UAS have such little room, they, uh, they don't have a lot uh, to show for autonomy. But in terms of control, uh, the system is able to, to navigate autonomously be between waypoints, but also is able to do area coverage. So you could name an AOI and uh, have the system go and recon that entire region. Um, it also has a standoff mode, uh, which is, uh, basically allows you to designate a potential target, a moving target, and the system will maintain its position with respect to that target. So for example, if you think about the third person perspective in a video game, uh, the, the aircraft will actually maintain its position with respect to some moving object, and if you want to rotate that, that perspective, oops, excuse me, sorry, rotate that perspective, uh, you can. Um, in terms of perception, uh, there's uh, an aerial stitching, image stitching mode that can be seen in the upper right of the image there, uh, pulling together multiple images into a single cohesive uh, situational awareness picture, and then uh, terrain awareness, which uses detailed data to indicate when the, uh, the system is getting too close to the ground. The squad mission support system, uh, or SMSS, is a relatively small uh, unmanned ground vehicle. It's all, it all depends on what perspective you're looking at. Um, it's about the size of a Gator, if you're familiar with those. Um, it comes in uh, five different variants. The one shown at top is the uh, logistics version. It's capable of carrying approximately 1,500 pounds of equipment. Um, clockwise, uh, or, I'm sorry, counterclockwise from there, there's also a recon surveillance and target acquisition variant, uh, an assault or direct fires variant, um, a uh, counter mine, counter IED variant, and then a mortar variant. <clears throat> to date, um, the logistics, RISTA, and uh, counter mine have all been implemented and tested in, uh, at our, our facility in Texas. So what can the system do? Um, it is capable of uh, traversing uh, very long distances autonomously. Uh, it has planners and sensors on board such that it can uh, traverse a distance of up to 60 miles, and, uh, and it does the long range planning uh, on board, and then it also uh, is able to do short range obstacle avoidance using a LIDAR, and, uh, and um, what it's doing uh, when it's doing the, this obstacle avoidance is it's using the LIDAR to detect potential obstacles, and in addition to just detecting the obstacle, it's determining its potential density. And um, what I mean by this is uh, it, would, it would be completely unsuitable to have the, the robot uh, see a, a blade of grass or a shock of grass in the, in the foreground and decide that it's not, it's not able to continue. So what we do is we look at the, the, the uh, relative density of the, the things that are in front of us and decide whether or not they can be pushed through or, or moved through. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The system is controlled using a handheld controller. Um, the, uh, the control allows the dropping of waypoints, uh, designation of, uh, of targets, and also teleoperation. And, uh, and you can also put that away and use voice control in which you can designate where to go, or a follow me mode, which basically allows the system to lock on into, onto an individual soldier and, uh, and track that soldier. Now the system is smart enough so that if a soldier goes somewhere it can't, it will find another route to follow. So if the soldier threads the needle between two narrow trees, the system will wrap around and, uh, and find another route. The same sort of technology, uh, except more advanced, has been implemented in the Autonomous Mobility Applique System. Uh, AMAS is, is an applique that's designed to be applied to manned systems to make them autonomous. Um, the, uh, the main objectives of the, uh, of the system are primarily uh, driver and vehicle safety, as well as uh, the automation of convoys. Um, you can see on the left-hand side there, six of the vehicles that we tested uh, AMAS on. The, uh, the capabilities that were imbued by this system uh, were broken down into to four different levels. Uh, the first level is, uh, is what the sort of things that you might see 
in a, uh, in a private, an expensive private car. Uh, warnings, indications that something might be about to go wrong. Um, as we get more, uh, a higher level, level two, uh, the system starts to influence the, uh, the driver's actions. So if you begin to diverge from the lane, the system will nudge the steering wheel in the direct, right direction when it warns you. Um, or it will slow you down if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front of you, that sort of thing. When it starts, uh, level three is where it starts to get really interesting because at this point we can actually take the driver completely out of uh, the cab of the vehicle. Um, this is the, the, uh, the robotic driver version of the system. And what we can do is really we follow the, ro ro <clears throat> the rules of the road uh, autonomously. We can uh, detect oncoming traffic and avoid it. We can uh, make decisions about uh, who got to the intersection first and when to go, taking turns correctly. Um, we can, uh, we can get, uh, as, as with the SMSS, we can make plans for very long distances, um, avoid uh, obstacles, etc. cetera. Um, and then finally, the, the level N was implemented with the JCTD. And the, the two main things that I wanted to point out with that were that the system is a, uh, was enabled to uh, perform dynamic rerouting, which is basically this idea that uh, it, gets to, uh, it gets to a place where it thought there was a, a traversable road, uh, but is unable to continue. And so it goes ahead and, and replans its route uh, in the most logical way it can, almost like uh, if you're using your GPS and you see an obstacle, you would begin to reroute and the GPS would, would uh, plan a new route for you. Um, the other uh, aspect of this, that of the level N, is the route replay. Um, we do rely heavily on GPS for, uh, for all of the work done uh, in levels one through N, or one through three. The route replay actually uses LiDAR data from a previous run, whether it's uh, a vehicle at the, the head of a convoy or from a vehicle uh, um, in a, you know, 10 days ago. And we can, we can use that data, data to actually position ourselves in an environment. So if a vehicle 10 days ago ran through a, a town and, uh, and successfully made it through that town, then without GPS, we can follow that same track uh, to, uh, to accomplish the same mission. Oh, and I should clarify, we don't have to follow the same track. We can use that data to position ourselves and know where the road is and perform the, the correct actions in that environment. The last uh, system I would like to talk about this morning actually comes from uh, my lab, and so is significantly farther out. It's not something that, uh, that has been deployed or we're even imagining of deploying anytime soon. Uh, the DARPA Robotics Challenge is really focused on creating robots for um, <clears throat> disaster response, and disaster response in human engineered environments, so environments where uh, legs and arms are really uh, essential. Uh, you think about ladders, uh, door handles, um, steps. These things all require uh, legs and arms to, uh, to effectively perform tasks in that environment. And so uh, we're, we're working on our version of that, which we call Trooper. Um, the, uh, the autonomy for this system is, uh, is very, very complicated. Unlike the systems that I spoke about just a moment ago, we can't simply say go from A to B because just the act of going from A to B requires an enormous amount of planning to know where the legs are going to go, how the dynamics of the, the system are going to work. And so this really is a step up in terms of complexity. <clears throat> the, uh, the result of that is that we, we are really focusing, as many of the teams are on the DARPA Robotics Challenge, on having an effective collaboration between the human and the machine. Um, giving the human the ability to perform those tasks that they are good at and having the machine uh, pick up the slack where, where they're good, where it is good, excuse me. An example of this would be uh, uh, one of the tasks that we need to perform is to pick up a drill and cut a hole in a wall using a cutting tool. And so uh, the, the system is, uh, uses a task decomposition approach and what we can do is have the operator indicate what tool uh, in the scene or what in the scene is a tool and what the operator wants to do with that tool. And uh, the robot then takes that very high level goal and decomposes it into a series of sub level or sub goals. Uh, walk to that target, um, move around this obstacle, uh, pick, pick up the, the, uh, the tool in a particular way so that it can be used, etc. cetera. Um, and once it's broken that down, it performs these sub, uh, sub goals autonomously. The, uh, 
the other aspect of this that we have incorporated is this, this idea of confidence assessment. As the robot goes through these individual sub goals, it, it looks at each of them and determines how confident it is that it can accomplish this goal. And so for example, when it gets to the tool, if there's an ambiguity about which way it's oriented, it may stop and say, my confidence is too low and request the operator to come back and, and tell it what to do or, or help it along. At which case, in which time, if, if it is helped along, it can continue with the autonomy from that point forward. So um, in summary, I just wanted to, uh, to say that we, we understand that the role in the environment of the soldier, of the warfighter, is incredibly complex. And ultimately, we want to take the soldier out of that environment um, to, to increase survivability. But to try to do that in one big leap is, uh, is a bridge too far. And so there, the 80% solution is something that we think we can attain. Um, and really, what we want to do is uh, have the correct near-term expectations and requirements uh, and, and, and employment concepts for, for the robotic systems so that we can speed acceptance. So thank you very much. So next up we have Dr. Simon Moncton from uh, DRDC. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you to, to uh, KKIS for letting me uh, speak to you, and thank you for your patience that you're going to exhibit as I, as I talk to you this morning. Uh, and the departure for me, I'm going to actually read from my notes rather than go uh, improv, which is my normal way. It, this is the plan to keep me on, on time, so watch my plan go awry would be my, my instructions to you. Anyway, good morning. In this talk this morning, I will briefly discuss the technical problem engineers like myself seek to solve. Using a few examples, I'll try to give you a very high level understanding of where we are today and uh, where we might be going. First though, it's important to understand that uh, robots have existed in one way or another uh, for over 100 years. So I've got a few examples. Uh, 150 years ago, this always amazes me even now, Whitehead's Marine Torpedo, 1866. First combat kill, 1891. Gyro stabilized in 1898, remarkable. 92 years ago, this was never fielded. Uh, the Kettering Bug, it was an attempt at a, at a uh, guided missile, if you like. Uh, it was radio control, they had all kinds of problems with that. Uh, gyroscopic pneumatic control, a barometer or rev counter to get you the impact. Of course, we all know about this. 72 years ago, the German V1 and V2, magnetically corrected heading, gyro, and timers. Sometimes it was even beam guided for the V2. Uh, circular error probable was a shocking 11 nautical miles, so not very precise. But also 72 years ago, and this is kind of an obscure one, the Fritz X and HS 293A, again, uh, two German systems, uh, radio controlled, even TV guided. Uh, they were actually taken, flown down to target by uh, an airborne uh, controller. Remarkable uh, level of remote control at that day and age. So it's pretty clear from these examples, I think, that we pursue these systems for two basic reasons. For standoff, we want to keep our own troops out of harm's way. And precision, we want to focus the use of these systems on a very specific target. With this kind of history, why don't we have robot soldiers already? The fact is, we have three problems. The world is so complex the robots are limited to only the simplest of environments, factory floors, open air, and water, and sometimes carpets. Robots are subject to three types of complexity. Mechanical complexity, <coughs> environmental complexity, and mission complexity. And these form a crude kind of coordinate system. With no effectors, you've got a very simple machine, lots of effectors, it's very complex to control. Flat environment, it's very easy to, to drive, complex environment like a city is very hazardous, very difficult to drive. And a mission can be something as simple as from A to B, uh, or it might be something as complex as defeat the enemy. Uh, very <coughs> complex. Any given system sits somewhere in that coordinate. People were asking before about the definition of autonomy. I like to use this as one measure of autonomy. If it's well suited, it sits 
properly, if it's well designed for its environment, it will appear for all intents and purposes fully autonomous. If the environment is too complex, or the mission's too hard, or the mechanism is too simple, it will not seem autonomous. So my point to you there is that autonomy is a subjective assessment of how it's performing. So how do we deal with this situation? We really only have one way to manage this complexity. Uh, through control systems, by uh, sensing, modeling, and planning our way through it, and finally acting in it. This term, SMPA, that you see here, uh, the original term was Sense, Think, Act, and it was coined by uh, Rodney Brooks many, many years ago. Uh, it was slightly modified later uh, to become Sense, Model, Plan, Act. Most robot engineers don't think in these terms, but when it comes to describing uh, the problems we have, it's a very useful tool, so I'll, I'll use it for the foundation of this talk. So over the last century, sensing has grown from simple contact switches like you'd see in a mine, uh, pressure sensing, to include really elaborate sensing, hyperspectral imagery, sonar, LIDAR. While we know that planning and modeling are important, how we should do this best, there is not a single answer. And these are the primary areas of investigation, as I think you saw in the uh, previous talk, that that is the nut of the problem. Many systems can get by with virtually no model or plan at all, such as iRobot's Roomba, that uses simple rules in response to simple sensors and miraculously things carpets. While these can cope with some complex environments, these reactive systems can be unpredictable. In fact, if you've ever seen a Roomba do its thing, it is completely unpredictable. To guarantee a predictable outcome, we need to have a model, and we have to work our way through a problem with some kind of planning. We call that a deliberative system. Most planning systems develop some form of path through a planning space, often testing possibilities one after the other. The bigger the planning space, the longer it takes. In practice, most use a blend of reactive and deliberative techniques to get reasonable performance. With a model and a plan, you can act. Often action is straightforward, drive or fly a course, but some environments are very difficult, and we have to do some clever design to get around that. In the end, it is the complexity still that gives robots trouble. And in this slide, I show you how that uh, manifests itself. On, uh, on the left, you have a very simple world that can be driven or flown over, and it takes very small controllers to do it. And on the right, you have a complex world with conceivably complex robots and possibly cloud computing to give that support. The issue here is that as the environment becomes more complex, you need a more complex mechanism to navigate it. It's just the way it is. And to try and express to your machine how to move through that environment uh, becomes difficult as well. The mission becomes complex to describe. To meet that, your sensors have to be more capable. Now you have to go from just GPS to LiDAR, uh, other 3D range sensing. And your command and control capabilities fall off as well. Your radio links are now more fragile. Uh, and the method in which you control becomes more complicated as well, the interface itself. All this spells a rise in computational capability. So that means that those uh, terrifying spiders in Minority Report or the, or the snake in, uh, in Terminator 4, uh, those are terrifying to you and to engineers like myself, they are terrifying as well because of the systems that are just so complicated they give us nightmares. So, this means that sensing has to grow substantially in resolution, dynamic range, and processing speed. I have a quick clip that I'd like to show. Uh, the clip is Clipped HD LiDAR. If we could just quickly go over and show that. I feel like I'm running out of time already. Okay. Do we have that clip? I can't see it. Ah, good. There you go. So this is a typical example, actually, the kind that uh, you've seen in the convoying machines of uh, high-density LiDAR. This is an HD64 produced by Velodyne, producing uh, 1.2 million points per second. It is a fire hose of, uh, of data. To cope with this flood, you can uh, end the video now, thank you. To cope with this flood of sensor data, models must grow in proportion. Of course, the mission also adds to complexity, requiring additional data into the model. For example, how am I supposed to express where are the friendly forces to this model and to my planning system? 
or can the enemy see me, or can I conserve fuel? These are all issues that have to be built into that modeling system. As the model grows, planning grows, and planning time lengthens. To simplify the problem, some systems actually adopt parallel SMPA systems to generate simultaneous behaviors. Then they kind of choose what the best route is, or perhaps they get a compromise, or they mix, or they do action chains. Regardless, from sensing through to action, greater complexity results in greater memory, greater computing power, and greater mobility requirements. Well, this makes the future of robotics sound pretty bleak because in the real environment, uh, we're looking at a very complex situation. The last decade has seen some, some, some significant technological changes. Some most of you know, others uh, only folks like myself, the robotics folks, uh, were familiar with. First, I'll just introduce you to the state of the art, what drives most robots today, uh, the ones you can buy off the shelf. And these are things that, that you're already familiar with. Global positioning, telecommunications, and electronic min miniaturization. With a few noteworthy exceptions, virtually all robots require access to GPS. In combination with advanced sensing, uh, GPS provides a global coordinate and time synchronization system in which models and plans can be built and executed. That said, as I think you saw in, uh, and, and probably already know, current models and plans of deployed equipment are rarely more than a map and a set of waypoints. Very simple. In any case, GPS has made the prospect of military robots at least conceivable. Since current robots have only the most basic situational awareness, military and civilian robots rarely if ever go without communications to a human operator, or off-leash as I prefer to call it. This makes telecommunications essential, and fortunately a wide variety of options exist, uh, from frequency hopping sped spectrum modems and cell networks to low bandwidth iridium and dedicated high bandwidth satcom. Uh, I have another video actually, uh, a cargo drop video, and if you could bring that up. Uh, so this is an example of a simple um, application of this kind of technology. Simple, but it was a, a very big project to put together. This is uh, the AFID uh, that we used to do a uh, cargo delivery project, and it's in fact uh, similar to the vehicle you see outside, uh, doing a cargo delivery demonstration not entirely unlike the uh, Cayman Caymax. An experimental platform uh, for us to understand uh, the difficulties around uh, light logistics. The point I'm trying to make with this video is that uh, that kind of capability is possible with just GPS, good INS, and a few very basic sensors. Of course, the final driver is electronics. Most of us have heard of Moore, Moore's Law, and you've got the graphic there, the standard graphic about Moore's Law. The idea that transistor density and, by implication, computing power doubles every two years. Of course, microprocessors are essential, but the real impact, I think, beyond that is that we now have microelectromechanical sensors, or MEMS. Uh, they're built using the same techniques, and they give us very tiny accelerometers and gyros that, when combined with GPS, provide cheap, accurate, and incredibly small inertial navigation systems, or INS. Now, current machines have excellent proprioception. They know where their limbs are, they know the state of the engine, engine temperatures, engine RPM, and so forth. They precisely know their own internal state. Beyond GPS and INS systems, these machines, however, have very little awareness of their environment, or exteroception. A predator aircraft does not yet see other air traffic and must fly in segregated airspace. A pack bot is helpless without direct human control. And an Ivor submarine must remain in open water since it can't communicate with its operators over long range while underwater. So, and I think the Atlas is a good example. We can build very complex robots that can appear to land on carriers, in the case of the uh, UCAV, trot through forests, uh, and climb walls, navigate parking lots, but their actual capacity to sense, model, plan, and act uh, in the outside world is primitive and relies completely on inertial navigation, communications, and human operators at the moment. But a number of new drivers promise great change. And these are the, these are the ones. Some of you would nod and say, yes, of course. Others, you'd go, what? 
So let's go through the, some of those. Probabilistic robotics is an obscure subject to the uninitiated, but it has completely changed the face of robotics over the last decade. One key problem with that SMPA cycle that we've been talking about is that it's brittle. One small error in sense can grow into broken machinery at the end of act. Probabilistic robotics takes imperfect sensors, imperfect models and plans, and works through uncertain actions. And it builds uncertainty and takes it into account in every step of the process, ensuring that the outcome of the plan includes some uncertainty and tries to get the best result. Some good examples are in uh, machine vision. By combining these techniques with novel image processing, new vision-based navigation has appeared that simultaneously senses uh, and models its surrounding environment. This will lead to systems that can passively locate and model the world simultaneously, just like we do, without the use of active sensors such as laser sonar or radar. I've got a little clip from, uh, it's called Clip Sam Slam MDA. If we can have that one up. That's Clipped Slam MDA. Right, so this is going to look really confusing at first. Uh, this is actually a uh, project done by McDonald Detweiler, also here today, uh, where a model has been assembled based on purely visual information. And there is no GPS. The only uh, information they have as to their location in this environment that has been built and into a model here is uh, purely visual information. Uh, and this is collected uh, slowly. It is not a real-time process, but it assembles a, a large model. That's good, you can, you can stop that now. I have better examples to come to. The other important element is the network, which of course you all know. Since the late 70s, networking has rapidly grown into every facet of modern life. Typically on the cloud, we all know and love. Not surprisingly though, it has changed robotics, but in some unexpected ways. One of the greatest, which you probably aren't aware of, is that of course research always builds on the work of others, but robotics, uniquely builds on the actual code of others. There's an incredible amount of code sharing that goes on in the robotics community. This has radically increased the pace of development worldwide in both standards of software and standards for robotics design. Of course, network communication means robots can uh, share sensing, modeling, and planning. But interestingly, computing now no longer needs to be resident in the devices. Robots need not carry their own computing horsepower. So I've got some examples here. Uh, probabilistic robotics has been essential for, and, and is the seed technology for future target recognition and tracking, simultaneous localization and mapping, which I showed you an example of, shared sensing and mapping, which will definitely promote GPS denied operations, and interestingly, fault tolerance, the ability to tell when a device or sensor has failed. Networking, of course, is now providing a means of IP protected code sharing and leveraging, which is not much to you, but it means a lot to us in the development world. Shared sensing and modeling, as I said, load sharing over the network, different uh, computing spread around the network. And interestingly, I think this will allow immersive VR and teleoperation akin to the Oculus Rift. Parallel processing. Now, to meet Moore's law that you saw the graphic of before, the semiconductor industry has been forced to parallelize computer architectures. So in a way, Moore's law has been broken. We're not really tracking the old, the old curve. From multi-core CPUs on your desktop today to array graphics processors on your gaming consoles, parallelization permits simultaneous processing that speeds numerically intensive tasks, such as game rendering, a form of modeling, multi-bot melee and search, a form of planning, audio and gesture-based interfaces, of course, you're sensing. All of these have sprung from and benefit robotics. Just as a, an aside, the, this uh, picture in the upper corner there is using a uh, SLAM-based algorithm, and it was used uh, in the Arctic last summer to, in one pass, model uh, local, uh, local terrain, which you can see there. Oops, going too far. Back up. Okay, so what does that mean for the future of robotics? Oh, no, back up. 
Let's play the clipped U Pen Slam. Okay, I'll be out soon. Clipped U Pen Slam. Okay, so this is done by the Grasp Lab, University of Pennsylvania, a really remarkable lab, uh, in which a uh, quad rotor um, maps the interior of a building and finds its own way through that building. This is an example of LiDAR-based SLAM. And I think it's a, a good example of what the future will be like for these small quad rotors. Okay, that's good, thank you. Okay. Back to the future. For the foreseeable future, UXBs will slowly enter more complex environments as sensing, modeling, and planning improves. I think we all agree that that's obvious enough. But let's get a little bit into the details. UAVs will operate at progressively lower altitudes and more complex airspace as parallel processing and high-speed local networks provide faster sensor processing, shared models, faster planning, and dynamic flight among structures. Examples include shipboard operations and possibly organic convoy route clearance. UUVs will operate closer to shore, near vessels, and harbor facilities as parallel processing permits faster onboard sonar imaging. Some examples here would be harbor inspection and demining. UGVs will need less handholding to perform complex operations, and they'll be supported by these same technologies. Examples are more difficult here, and certainly they're the subject of great uh, curiosity and research, but will likely include squad support robots, as we've, as we've seen, and smart convoy vehicles, also as we've seen. These machines will all be designed from the start as networking, parallel, with onboard capability in processing for sensing, modeling, and planning. Does this mean, and I think this is where this uh, conference is going, does this mean that you and I will see on the battlefield uh, robots that don't need human control? From the robotics perspective, the answer is unclear. In my opinion, this is not technically feasible in my lifetime, other than perhaps through substantial off-board computing using high bandwidth communications. And on that note, I want you, so, want you to ask yourself the following question. And uh, I'll let you come up with the answer on your own. And I bet you, you end up choosing the first one, not the second one. If you're like me, your answer reflects the likelihood that human operators will continue to play a vital role in unmanned operations. <coughs> for no other reason than they offer such immense capabilities. Every technical innovation that supports an autonomous combat system supports a remote telepresence system even more. In truth, of course, it will be some solution in between that uses limited machine intelligence to support human oversight. And it will always continue to serve the same two principles that we discussed before, standoff and precision. That's it, thank you. Thank you for another excellent presentation. And now we have our final speaker, who, uh, JC Lede from DARPA. Good morning. So uh, I guess you know I'll uh, I'll go in the reactive uh, type, not the deliberative. Uh, uh, I there's no plan, and you know help me keep on on time. Uh, so the uh, uh, I'm uh, JC Lede, or as I, I can say here, I, actually I was toying with the idea of of doing this presentation in French. Uh, which would be uh, you know, a very rare occurrence for me, uh, but I will spare you that because it could actually be even worse than in English. Uh, so, uh, but if you if you are a, a French speaker, you can call me Jean Charles. Otherwise, I go by JC. I'm uh, with the uh, Tactical Technology Office at DARPA, and I'll uh, present you uh, first uh, a few uh, intro slides on DARPA. It might help uh, you uh, if you're not familiar with uh, DARPA. Is the uh, uh, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Uh, it's um, a relatively small uh, component of DoD, but with, uh, you know, we like to believe uh, 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 out of proportion um, uh, return on investment. Uh, we are about a three billion dollar agency uh, per year, 2.9 in FY15, uh, but we, we think we have uh, brought a lot of key technologies to, uh, to the DOD and, and frankly, uh, to uh, all of industry. 
Um, so I'll start with that. I'll walk you a little bit through some of the uh, state of the art and, and how uh, uh, we got to some of the technologies that, uh, uh, that uh, my colleagues presented. And then I'll, t I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, one of the programs that uh, I am pushing at DARPA uh, uh, to, um, to tell you where we think uh, we might be going next. So DARPA was founded in 1957 uh, after uh, uh, what uh, the U.S. considered a strategic surprise uh, being beaten to space by, by the Russians uh, and uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, Sputnik. Uh, this was a shock uh, uh, for uh, all of the country and uh, President Eisenhower uh, created DARPA uh, in, in response to that with the, uh, uh, the mission uh, to prevent uh, uh, future uh, such strategic surprises and to really create uh, strategic surprises of that magnitude to our adversaries. Um, we, we have a very uh, unique uh, business model at DARPA where uh, each one of us has a, an expiration date. Uh, where program managers such as me uh, basically are typically uh, three to five years uh, in the agency uh, so very rapid turnaround, and uh, uh, which reduces the uh, uh, fear of failing. So we are not afraid to take big risks uh, because no matter what, after five years, they throw us out anyway. Um, so it, it also enables uh, uh, the uh, uh, killing bad ideas, which uh, is not as easy as it sounds. Uh, in other organizations. If the idea is not good, it will not survive the passing of the program manager. So I think from that perspective, we've had a, a, a pretty long string of uh, significant uh, innovation uh, with DARPA. It's a flat organization, uh, outstanding program managers, except you know for the one standing in front of you, I guess. Uh, the, uh, 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 we are project-based, so very focused on uh, delivering uh, certain uh, uh, capabilities uh, that, that are uh, embedded in an in a agreement between the program manager and the agency director. There's no DARPA lab. If you're ever in the Washington, D.C. area, you can stop by. Uh, uh, you will not be impressed by DARPA. It's a building. It's an office building, and that's pretty much it. There's no, no uh, hidden uh, hangar or anything like that. Everything is uh, outside, so keep it lean. Uh, that, that allows you to not uh, accumulate uh, bad, bad ideas and, and uh, baggage that you don't want. And, and you know, uh, really, uh, one of the best things from my perspective, uh, being a, a DARPA <coughs> program manager, I get to work with all the best people uh, in the industry, in the country, and in some cases uh, with, uh, with foreign partners as well. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I, I accepted the invitation to come today is because I really wanted to uh, extend a hand uh, and, and see if there were opportunities to work with uh, our uh, neighbors up north. There are uh, six technical offices at DARPA. The, uh, they are distributed as is. The, the biology, biological technology office uh, is uh, really looking at how you can uh, advance uh, technologies in biology, such as uh, vaccine uh, making or uh, leveraging uh, more uh, DNA-based capabilities. So how would you um, uh, leverage, understand the genes, and so on. The Defense Science Office uh, sometimes introduce themselves as a DARPA of DARPA. They're really looking at very early fundamental science. They are very good in the materials, mathematics, and so on. Uh, I2, the Information Innovation Office, is working on cyber, uh, big data, uh, really, uh, and ISI exploitation. How, how do you go from drowning in data, as has been famously said, uh, to actually making sense of this? Uh, the Microsystem Technology Office uh, brought, for example, the MEMS technology that uh, Mark mentioned earlier, uh, and is working very hard on precision navigation technologies. So that's the, the, what they're looking at. The Strategic Technology Office 
uh, is uh, working on uh, sensing uh, EW and have a, a current focus on system of systems. We are looking at how do you decompose the extremely complex systems into uh, more manageable chunks and how do you ensure interoperability between those systems. And last but not least is the uh, Tactical Technology Office, uh, which is the office I'm from, and we are working mostly on the platforms and how do we deliver all of those prior effects. So here is the, uh, uh, the chart, that part of the legacy from, uh, uh, from the office I'm in. Uh, one of the uh, technologies we've worked with is uh, uh, on early on um, stealth, for example, with half blue, tacit blue, uh, which obviously was transitioned into the F-117 and now is embedded in pretty much all of our newest generation aircraft. We also uh, had a very significant role in developing unmanned aircraft, uh, early investment into what uh, became the Predator, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, the, uh, the Global Hawk, the uh, U-Class that was mentioned earlier uh, with uh, uh, the uh, initially U-CAS, which became the J-U-CAS and, and is now the uh, U-Class uh, that uh, may give us a, uh, an aircraft able to operate from an aircraft carrier. The uh, A-160 is another example. Uh, this one was a, a very advanced helicopter with long endurance uh, capability uh, and, uh, and uh, the current emphasis uh, for platform development is more around the uh, hypersonic uh, platforms. The uh, uh, similar development on the maritime ground system, a lot of work in space. Space is an area where we have uh, adopted from the beginning autonomy as the way to go uh, because of the uh, restrictions that would come if you were to put a, a man uh, on every satellite. What I wanted to point here is this is a very uh, one platform centric uh, at a time and, and really when you think of it uh, that has been uh, the push for autonomy is take one system and try to make it uh, smarter and smarter uh, in and of itself. Uh, uh, migrating some of the uh, uh, required uh, activities for the human into the machine. Obviously, some of that, for example, is uh, in the autopilot, and the autopilots are essentially taking some of the closed-loop control capability of the human, putting it into a machine. That enabled a radically different kind of aircraft. Um, so, if, if you think of, uh, uh, of that trend over the years, really, it's a continuation towards migrating some of what the human does into uh, a piece of silicone, essentially, uh, that is supported by the sensors uh, as needed. And I believe autonomy is, is, is not something new. It is just a, you know, a continuum of, of, uh, of uh, capabilities, not necessarily a revolution, as uh, General McMaster said, but an evolution. And where do we you know, start calling it autonomy versus automation, I think is a moving post. It is, once we have it, we get com comfortable with it, and then suddenly it's just part of the normal way of doing business. Uh, you, do no, you no longer control your brakes in your car. Uh, we used to mention, or when I was uh, a bit younger, oh, does it have uh, uh, anti-blocking uh, system, ABS? I, I don't remember the last time I worried about that looking at my car. Pretty much every car has it. It's just part of that. So we no longer talk about ABS, we just brake. And we don't realize that when we push the brake, it actually goes through a computer that implements that, that order. Uh, so autonomy is the same way. It's uh, a, a, a mean of delegating certain tasks uh, to, to uh, a, a surrogate or, or a, a lower uh, system. And, and you know, to that extent, I often explain that I work on autonomy, not independence. And autonomy is something you give, independence is something you take. Uh, so there's a difference, and I think you know, we, we need to continue uh, uh, to evaluate how much autonomy we put in our systems and to what end, as uh, uh, the uh, panel speakers mentioned. So, uh, Switch, uh, switching gear a little bit, uh, here I'm going to tell you about a program that 
is looking beyond a single platform and, and how do we enable uh, systems to uh, work together in a denied environment. And, and while I present you this program, I'll try to mention some of the limitations that were uh, already uh, mentioned. First, uh, uh, I think it's useful to explain what is a denied environment in this context. And essentially, we have uh, adversaries who uh, have been studying how we wage uh, war and, and how we're able to uh, achieve uh, uh, superiority in all domains. And, and they have been systematically um, uh, putting in place uh, systems to deny us these advantages. First, they're trying to force us to operate from longer distances. Uh, they are also contesting the electromagnetic spectrum dominance that we've enjoyed for so many years. Uh, that means that navigation that is so critical to current system is uh, being uh, challenged. The communication on which our current uh, unmanned systems, uh, remotely piloted aircraft, uh, depend so much is being uh, challenged as well. So. Um, basically, the current generation of unmanned aircraft would be more or less useless in, in a, uh, a 280 environment. They know that if it doesn't move, we can kill it. Uh, so everything is on wheels. Uh, at least all the early uh, uh, targets are uh, on mobile and that really makes uh, the uh, kill chain very complicated because we have a hard time getting the data uh, in time uh, to, to prosecute those mobile targets. Lots of deception in the battlefield uh, using decoys, using uh, uh, spoofing and, and other uh, methods to uh, make it really difficult to know what, to, what is an actual uh, threat or not. It, this is a high threat environment, they shoot back. Uh, our unmanned aircraft haven't had to deal with that. Uh, really, uh, from my background, uh, uh, you know, which is a mix of unmanned aircraft and missiles, I like to see that high threat environment as a target rich environment. Uh, but lots of things in the battlefield, lots of, of threats. And finally, it's fully integrated. They are uh, very tightly net, and that creates a problem in and of its own. So, how do you deal with an environment like that? So, to, to date, we've been pushing stealth. Uh, which uh, is, is great and even though I chose that picture I still have a hard time seeing that chameleon uh, in the tree it's that good uh, but there is one I promise uh, you can do speed that's the current push towards hypersonics um, numbers eh, not so popular anymore uh, you know, carpet bombing uh, is not uh, uh, very uh, um, CNN friendly and and and, and uh, it's not uh, uh, it's it's very expensive to deploy. You have a lot of platforms to bring all those those uh, uh, bombs. And the last one, you know, I call poison here. It's EW cyber. We, we can say cyber now. We're allowed to admit that uh, there is such a thing as offensive cyber. Uh, but but essentially, we are looking at uh, uh, more subtle ways of uh, dealing with the adversaries. I believe there's a fifth way and that's collaboration. Uh, this is how, I, how we um, uh, got on top of the food chain. We didn't get on top of the food chain because we had, uh, you know, we were able to outrun our prey, so because we were able to hide better, we were able to get there because we worked together. And, and that's the proposition I, I uh, gave to uh, my management. I said, listen, we need to look at can we, through collaborative autonomy, enable our current assets uh, to perform missions that they were not envisioned to perform? Uh, and uh, through doing that, obviously we're creating new mission capabilities, but we're also uh, uh, leveraging uh, a significant investment and magazine depth that uh, would otherwise not be useful in the type of environment I described before. If we do this, we cannot uh, expect uh, to have, uh, you know, depending how you want to count between two and 40 people behind each uh, one of our unmanned uh, vehicles. And, and certainly, uh, uh, not only would we want to save on uh, the staffing requirements to conduct those missions, but we would also want to look at 
how could we uh, increase emission efficiency. In the case of a strike mission, that could be reducing the number of uh, missiles needed to accomplish uh, the, uh, the strike. So that's, that was the program I proposed, which was uh, uh, accepted. This is a program structure. At the top, just like uh, uh, John McMaster mentioned, uh, you start by defining what is your uh, mission, what is your operational concept. And what that top line is, is uh, OS, I apologize for the uh, uh, unexplained uh, acronyms here, operational system. We're looking at what is the operational system that we would want to add this autonomy to and how would they work, how effective are they. If they are effective, then uh, there would be a phase two program in which we would actually go ahead and demonstrate the software and, the, and conduct the flight uh, demonstration of the program. Um, there are uh, different uh, tracks during the phase one where we are looking at, again, the whole system concept and some critical technologies I'll touch briefly on. And one um, important aspect of the program is creating an environment that enables us to leverage the work done by others. And that's this uh, purple line in the middle uh, that's for the open architecture. So those are the a few things I will talk about. First, what's the promise of, of uh, uh, collaboration? There are lots of potential things it could improve. It can improve navigation. It can improve communication. It can help you find targets. Uh, without requiring new uh, sensors or without requiring new uh, automated tar uh, target recognition algorithms, we know those are very expensive to develop. Instead of improving the ATR algorithms, can we give them better data? And in that way, help us find the target better and then identify the target. This is a kind of collaborative um, uh, capabilities that code is uh, first evaluating in these operational system through modeling and simulation. And thank you. And then uh, move into uh, uh, the uh, uh, flight test demonstration. For technology areas, these are the three missions we selected. And um, uh, the, I'll, I'll go quickly on, on the first one. You cannot have an autonomous team without having some autonomous vehicles. In this aspect, what we are looking at is how do we improve our ability to uh, make sense of their own sensors, emission sensors, so sensor, uh, sensor exploitation on board, which allows you to reduce your bandwidth requirements to send the data. The, uh, uh, once you have some uh, uh, pre-processed data, you need to uh, make a plan, just like uh, Mark was mentioning. Uh, you have your model, you now need to make a plan. When you are in a team, you need to do that in a uh, collaborative manner. The uh, next step here is, is very important, starting again going back to the fact that we are working on autonomous system, not independent system. There always will be a human involved in the operation. The systems do not watch CNN and decide to go to war on their own. They are going to uh, always be a commanders in charge and how do we facilitate uh, uh, that interaction between the commanders and the machines through commanders intent and how do we put the rules of engagement and validate that the system will be able to follow those rules of engagement uh, how do we vary them uh, in the course of of the mission uh, if needed those are the uh, element of supervisor interface and finally the uh, 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 open architecture for code, and I think I'm running out of time, but the key aspect of open architecture, or at least one key aspect of open architecture, is not only do I want to create an architecture that will enable future partners uh, to bring in capabilities and rapidly integrate them into our weapon systems, but we also need to think about the testability. And, and as of today, I would say one of the biggest challenge for a concept such as code is really we do not have a good uh, concept for the uh, operational test and evaluation. It's hard enough when you're launching one missile to validate it's going to do what it will do over the broad uh, range of, uh, of operation. But when you're looking at a salvo of missiles that are collaborating, how will you validate that to the point where we can deliver a, a system to our warfighters? 
so on this, I will um, uh, stop and uh, let Stephanie take over again. Thank you. I just want to thank our panelists. We had uh, three very interesting presentations, all very high tech, lots of arrows, lots of acronyms, uh, but at the same time, very accessible. So I do appreciate uh, that uh, for speaking. Um, I think what was great about the panel is that all three speakers in some ways really kind of address the, um, uh, where we are now in terms of, of the technology. Um, uh, there was the addressing of where we have been, the idea that robots really have kind of, kind of in their earliest forms been around for 150 years. Uh, the need to avoid strategic surprise driving some of this change and developments, and as well as some of the challenges uh, that largely come from the fact that, you know, it is just so complex uh, bringing, um, you know, this kind of idea of autonomy uh, to life, especially in terms, I, I think, I, I like the idea of uh, uh, Dr. Moncton's uh, idea of breaking it into mechanical, environmental, and mission challenges. And then, of course, it was the uh, emphasis on where we are going, which is driving a lot of this conference in, uh, in terms of, uh, and again, it was the idea of uh, probabilistic robots, networking, parallel processes, and of course, the very interesting code projects that uh, DARPA is working on. Um, the other thing that was kind of made clear by this panel is that humans seem to be in the picture, at least for the, the medium, if not long term, if not the rest of my life. So I, I'm pretty sure everyone here does have a secure employment future for the meantime. And uh, I'm very glad at least there's no autonomous panel chairing and I forgot to be here for uh, this panel. So I believe we have about 20 minutes for questions. Um, perhaps uh, if, if someone would like to volunteer. Yes. Oh, and if you'd be so kind as to introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, yeah, Robert Bunker, SSI, uh, FBI. I have a question for Peter about autonomous vehicle countermeasures. Would it be possible to approach this via logical kill zone creation? And what I'm thinking is you could do this in the physical environment by means of exploiting programming sub processes. Yeah, what I'm thinking of is you can create logical kill zone creation. So if you're going to deal with the, one of these systems, you look at the processes of the programming and the sub goals, and then within the physical environment, you can basically trick it down the path you want to for either channeling purposes or kill purposes. It'd be like you'd be like taking on a tank in one level, but this would be an autonomous system. Certainly, there are uh, there are a number of ways to. Uh, as, as an earlier speaker uh, pointed out, uh, there are uh, countermeasures for every system, right? And so as, as the technology develops and as the countermeasures develop, uh, we will come up with countermeasures to their countermeasures. Um, the uh, particular situation that you're talking about, I would have to think about in a little bit more detail to really come up with a, an interesting answer. But uh, I believe that, uh, that there are opportunities to, uh, to avoid the, uh, the channeling of the, of the vehicle in this case. Thank you. Captain Andrew Stimus, Canadian Army Doctor and Training Center. So in General McMaster's opening remarks, he spoke about how geography and people complicate warfare and land. Also note that Robert Kaplan also touched on this in his book, Revenge of Geography, noting that recent military conflicts have exposed the limits of technology in complex terrain and urban areas. Given the fact that military technology is becoming increasingly expensive, there are some who say we are becoming too reliant on technology to fight our wars due to the prohibitive cost and inability to mass sufficient combat power. As scientists with clear vested interest in this, what would your response to this line of thinking be? Um, I think that I'm just going to perhaps respond to that, and perhaps also I should uh, allow the panelists to respond to any of the other panelists as well. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was just going to say that um, there, there are many parallels between what we do for the DMD and what the commercial sector does to, uh, to um, help the individual citizen. Um, the, the technology that we use uh, to, to get a robot from, from A to B is very much like uh, what has been developed by Google to, to get you from A to B. And so um, exploiting those, uh, those parallelisms 
uh, can certainly drop the price and, and to make it a, a, um, an achievable goal to have uh, incredible numbers uh, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our defense applications. So I, I, I think the key, uh, uh, if you're going to look at uh, robots, is that uh, you can make them actually simpler by one leveraging the commercial uh, elements. Uh, in fact, uh, there were examples on YouTube of uh, the Ukrainian, uh, uh, I, I guess some, they were not the uh, regular armed forces for Ukraine, but uh, people who are resisting uh, the uh, advances of the uh, independentists uh, using uh, commercial technology to uh, call for uh, support fire. Uh, and they cr crowdsourced uh, that, that UAV that cost something like $2,000. So in fact, I think you know, by leveraging this kind of technology, you do have the ability to create more mass. Unlike manned platforms where we tend to put more and more technologies, they become more and more expensive, as you know, uh, famously uh, depicted in the Augustine's Law, uh, Man, I, mean, I think we have an opportunity to keep our uh, unmanned systems cheaper and, and, and distribute the capabilities so you don't have to put everything on one, so they don't have to become bigger and bigger. So I, I, I believe you have an opportunity there to uh, create mass again uh, by leveraging more directly commercial technology and limiting the capabilities of any individual platform and, uh, and, uh, and limiting their size. I, I'll come out firmly uh, and say I, I'm not really sure. Uh, I think I think that uh, if you look at something like the Kinect uh, sensor that was built by Microsoft, that sensor was ex extremely expensive. That idea, that concept, was extremely expensive before Microsoft uh, chose to develop it, um, on the order of sort of fifteen thousand dollars, say as a number. Um, Microsoft shocked everybody by producing this and selling it for 150 bucks, and, and it was sustainable at that price. Uh, part of me wants to say that I, I agree with you that the ground uh, geography can become so hard that it may render uh, autonomous solutions absurdly expensive and there's just no point. What, what are we trying to achieve? But at the same time, there's that Microsoft example on mass production and and the infrastructure that, for example, the code project is, is uh, trying to build. Um, so the other part of me is very hesitant to commit to, to saying, oh no, that's, that's ludicrous, we never, never spend that much, because it's quite possible it won't be that expensive uh, a couple of generations from now. Sorry for such a weekly answer. So just one last comment. Um, as we look at, uh, ju just as, a, as a, uh, an example, as we look at the DARPA uh, Grand Challenge, um, the, the initial grand challenge used um, a, a very, very complicated uh, LiDAR that ran somewhere between eighty and $100,000 per unit. Um, today, uh, well then there was the urban challenge, they got a little bit less expensive. Um, today, they're running around $30,000 per unit and the same company that, that is, uh, there are a handful of companies competing, but they're, one of them is pushing very hard to get their stuff into the high-end cars. And their price point, their goal, is to get it to about $100 per unit. And, you know, so that obviously, that, that parallelism, parallelism uh, could really help the, the defense industry as well. I, I'd like to add, though, uh, I guess it's a strike against, against these systems, uh, is that field maintainability and, um, and fragility is probably the, the weakest point for these systems, particularly on the ground. So I, I, don't, I don't see them being, like I said, in my lifetime, being pervasive on the ground. And, and just continue down that, that uh, line. Uh, commercial is doing great job. I mean, Google and, and uh, other, other um, you know, entities are doing an incredible job at developing uh, autonomous uh, cars. However, uh, the way they are doing it is probably not very applicable to the, uh, to the defense needs. I was going to say DOD, but I'll, I, I'll try to pr uh, bring you up uh, in, in that mix. Uh, because what they're doing is they're doing it through uh, basically cloud computing. Uh, so they're offloading a lot of the work that the car would have to do normally locally uh, off board. 
uh, and uh, they are doing it also in a uh, somewhat uh, uh, friendly environment where you know there's no uh, malicious intent there are obviously you know events that happens but not so much uh, like uh, what we face uh, on uh, our operations so although there's lots of really good work in the commercial developing uh, especially autonomous vehicle I think uh, there's also some uh, risk associated uh, with that that they are not addressing for our operation uh, so dependence on the on the constant network dependence on access to those database uh, it, it's not it's not obvious that they will be able to use that directly so identifying those gaps uh, I think is is a very important aspect understanding what they're going to do uh, probably better cheaper than we will and and filling the gap from uh, from there to make their capabilities useful to us. I think that's the key element. Thank you. Great, next question. Hello, my name is John Siebert. I'm from Waterloo, Ontario. I have a question going in different directions on technology development. One is higher, which is any impact foreseen in the near future of quantum computing in your world. But also, one of your slides, uh, Jean-Charles, inspired the question, um, looking at human capabilities being transferred into silicon, wouldn't it be simpler to use insect or mammal uh, capabilities as an intermediate step and see our uh, inspirations from that world? So, uh, um Inspiration, I mean, so it depends how you're thinking. I mean, I think lots of people are looking at how um, is the animal kingdom doing amazing things uh, and trying to take that inspiration and, and, and looking at new kinds of algorithms and, and things like that. If that's what you mean, yes. If what you mean is trying to take control of uh, uh, cockroach and, and other um, uh, animals uh, there is such a research I'm really not familiar with it so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to comment on on it uh, too much uh, so but yeah I think you know definitely looking at what uh, you know uh, mother nature does how uh, it organizes complex uh, organisms uh, or uh, groups of organisms uh, uh, is is definitely something we do in fact one of the pictures that I show when I show the collaboration is um, wolves hunting, uh, and it's a wolf pack. And, and uh, there was a, a program that actually studied how wolves uh, collaborate. And uh, there's actually very little uh, active collaboration during the hunt. Uh, there's essentially one bit uh, exchange, and that's when the wolves raise their hair they're about to attack, uh, and the other wolves understand that uh, there's a change of behavior. Uh, so studying these things, I, I think it can be uh, uh, absolutely uh, useful, uh, uh, but using them directly, I'm not sure. It's, it's a challenge for me just to get my dog to fetch. So, <laughs> um, so do you have a question? Hi, my name is Sam. I'm uh, Sam, Sam Carey. I'm an intern here at the Center for International Defense Policy, making me a very, very small fish in this pond. Uh, something you, all of you touched a little bit on is the, uh, the advances made in the private sector as well. Uh, the private sector is very, very good when it creates technology, of making a strong, uh, a strong relationship with the, with the audience that they wish to purchase that product. I identify with, with my phone. I buy a car because it reflects who I wish to be. Uh, in uh, in this context, our relationship with technology is very, very important. Uh, how do you foresee the relationship of the people to uh, your technologies that you propose, especially the autonomous ones that will be used on the battlefield consistently? Uh, how those, like, uh, how those would affect and what relationship they would have with non-combatants during a, a counterinsurgency in, in, in operation, and with the people using them. For example, I uh, I can forgive my I can forgive my coworker when they mess up because we've had so much joint experience together. It's vital relationship with that individual. Uh, when you're dealing with something that perceives things as combatants or non-combatants as opposed to people, how does that affect the operational environment in a counterinsurgency situation? So. 
I think the, the context that, that we most often think about uh, something related to your question, I think I'm touching on it correctly, is the idea of, of the warfighter trusting the machine that they're working with. Um, the, uh, what we, we, we have significant research looking into what, what is required to make uh, these robotic systems um, um, not predictable, but understandable to the human. So that when, uh, when that machine uh, maneuvers in a particular way or um, acts in a particular way, the human doesn't lose faith in it and put it away. Because uh, the, the largest obstacle to, uh, to our uh, implementing these things uh, could be the, the warfighter throwing it on the shelf. Um, uh, I guess I have more of an apocryphal story of uh, soldiers in the field with EOD robots uh, uh, working in a particularly difficult situation where the batteries run out on, on this one EOD robot. And they so trusted this, this particular robot and, and were so dependent on it that they risked their lives to bring it back, <laughs> which is kind of a situation you don't want to have. Uh, but. It does show that um, in, the, in the right situation when it's a trustworthy system and it's doing something predictable and useful, um, that people in a, in a very simple way bond with, uh, bond with this equipment. Um, that said, I'm uh, reaching way back <coughs> earlier uh, this morning, uh, the idea of uh, normative standards of uh, what we consider autonomous versus what we what we don't consider autonomous or what we just consider routine. Um, I think a lot of uh, future systems we feel there, there will be no relationship one way or the other, it'll be just a, one system. Uh, but in, in these unusual cases, there will be you know, either deep distrust or, or, or deep trust in the systems. So I, I think the, your question goes directly into the trust, and I see trust as one of the three fundamental pillars of autonomy. Uh, the first one being the algorithms, everything basically that um, we describe from sensing, modeling, uh, uh, you know, uh, planning, and, and then acting. That's kind of embedded in, in the algorithms. Uh, the second is the uh, human system interface, which is one of the more complicated uh, aspect of uh, the uh, ground uh, robotics, is the uh, robots are interacting in a lot closer relation with, uh, with humans. Uh, when you fly an aircraft, uh, you know, you have much more uh, distance between you and, 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 and the human especially uh, our own soldiers uh, interacting with a robot. So if you have an unmanned squad member uh, and that squad member you know, does a rapid movement, you don't want them to whack your soldier doing that. So, so the, the human interface is much more complicated, I think, for the uh, ground robotics than for others. And, and the last one is really trust. And I, I see trust as a multi-layer uh, um, problem. One, the first layer is really uh, trust for us, the researchers. Uh, do, we, do we believe the systems are, are workable? Uh, we have uh, classes of algorithms that we're going to choose because they are easier to uh, prove correct and so on. The second really is, as I mentioned, is that uh, test and evaluation. How, how do we develop systems that we can test properly and, and, and to the extent needed um, before we can then give it to the third layer, which is the operator. And the operator needs to have this inherent trust and need to be able to interact, they need to understand the system, how it works. The fourth layer that people don't often put in that is the public. In the case of the, uh, the ground robots, it would be again the uh, non-combatants, uh, the civilians uh, that are around, but uh, frankly it's us voters uh, if we do not trust the systems, we will put pressure and then the system will never be deployed. So those are the, the four fundamental layers of trust in my view, and I think each one of them is addressed in a little different way, um, but they are all very important and will not allow us to deploy the system unless we address that. There's one other thing I'd like to leverage that comment, is uh, trust is so important, uh, particularly with uh, teleoperated systems. Uh, that actually, I think it represents uh, an opportunity for counters. Uh, if 
you may not have a fully effective counter, but if the counter is effective enough to undermine the trust that the operators have on the system, uh, that could be a mission kill. You know, you may withdraw the, the vehicle simply because you don't trust it. We would never deploy them if That's you're right. so concerned about cyber attacks or, or, or things of that nature. Great, small fish, but a great question. Um, now, I, Napoleon once said an army marches on its stomach, so um, I do not wish to stand between uh, an army and food. Uh, right, but I do I take, there's one more question. Is it, is it brief? Yes. Oh, great, okay, thank you. Question may be brief. <laughs> Good morning. I'll do my best. Good morning, my name is uh, Chief I'm a maritimer, so I live in five feet of snow, minus 26 months a year, and I train in the Arctic. So in the Arctic, there's no permanent satellite, there's zero to no communication, and I'm guided by an Inuit on a 1975 snow jet. So my question is, do you have anything to help me out? I'm sorry, you're on your own. And do we think that anybody will ever cross the pond? Well, I, I can speak from experience. I was in alert last summer, uh, and we, which is not really that cold, uh, but it was certainly Arctic conditions. Uh, for, for the basic tools required for uh, autonomy, uh, the Arctic actually has uh, excellent GPS coverage at the right latitudes. The high, high Arctic has excellent GPS coverage. Uh, and we found uh, very little difficulty, in fact, operating our ground and, and uh, air vehicles in the Arctic. Uh, Long-range communications is absolutely a problem, and I'm sure that's at the heart of uh, many people in this room worrying about how we're going to sustain uh, real-time communications to the Arctic. Uh, that's someone, else, someone else's problem to solve. But if that problem is solved, that, I, I see that as really the last major barrier. Uh, Mobility is a problem, and maintenance is a huge problem. Uh, it's one thing to put something up there, it's another thing to maintain it. Uh, those are all, all issues, but I think, in principle, there's no uh, major difference between the uh, Arctic and, and the stuff. Thank you. Great. Well, I hope you will join me in thanking our panelists for an excellent, uh, for excellent presentations, excellent Q and A. Um, and I don't know if there's any housekeeping to do, but I believe we are. Oh yes, there is housekeeping. Okay. <laughs> you set me up as the guy between you and food, so uh, there you go. Uh, very quickly on a housekeeping issue, uh, there's three, four gentlemen that uh, need to identify themselves to Moraine. She works in the room next door. Brian Roach, Tyler Chet, one, Brian Taylor, and Jason Santiago. In the break, there's some uh, great uh, uh, displays by McDonald Deadwire Corporation, the robot that's out there, the, the representative. Active Biotics, the wearable robot, and of course, uh, make it uh, training with the helo out the front door of the hotel towards the lake, and you will find it. Uh, we're going to get back together at 11:15 sharp for panel two.